Hello, and welcome to Crew Call, the Below the Line podcast by, for, and about the crew. Hello again, Crew Call listeners. It's me, producer Chris, at your service again. Now, we don't have a guest for you today, but we here at Crew Call Central didn't want to leave you high and or dry without your weekly dose of educational industry shop talk. So the plotters and planners up on the top floor called down to my dimly lit dungeon to see if I had anything useful to say. When I was done laughing, I realized that I've had just enough experience in indie sound recording to offer maybe some advice to those of you who are just now starting out in the business or hope to one day take that blind leap into the abyss. Now, a little about me to get you started. I moved to Los Angeles just over a year ago. I'm 29 years old, kind of spend some time in the restaurant supply industry before I I realized what I would actually rather be doing. And I'm largely self-taught as an audio engineer. I know a good deal about the physics of sound. I know how it behaves in different spaces, how to counteract negative behavior of it where possible. I know about, say, the inverse square law, which is something I just mentioned to make me sound smart to those of you who don't know about the inverse square law. I've recorded and mixed music for at least the last 15 years, uh, but I've had very little time alongside people who know more about it than I do, which is great on the one hand because the people I work with tend to trust me, but it's rough on the other because study only gets you so far. Experience is really the best teacher, and if you can watch somebody else who is experienced, you learn so much more so much faster than figuring it out on your own. So my career up to this point has been an exercise in extreme awareness of my own limitations, because you put it another way, I'm extremely comfortable with sound recording, but I'm still really, really quite new to film sound recording. So here we go, compiled for your listening pleasure in tried and true listicle format. Four things I've learned so far about indie production as a self-taught sound recordist. So number four, and... Yes, we are counting down. Just because you have no idea what you're doing doesn't mean you can't do it. So I got on set for the first time because my old roommate, Chandler Forbes, the uh, grip electrician you'll remember from episode 14, he told some of his colleagues that I was interested in getting into film sound, and I got called in for a little one-day gig with Gorilla Pictures in Grand Rapids, Michigan as a result. You know, I figured I'd be helping out their regular sound guy maybe boom up, that sort of thing. Uh, so I show up and I'm, I'm ready to meet the guy and, you know, see what I'm about to learn. And instead, one of the camera guys showed me to Gorilla's equipment locker and was like, just take what you need. And so I promptly uh, shit a brick and then cobbled together a small kit based on what I knew was necessary based on the reading I'd done. And off we went. But this was all guesswork. It was all best guesses and best practices, and that's been my life as a sound guy so far. You know, dropped from a cliff learning to fly on the way down. I got my first couple gigs because somebody I know thought I could handle it, and I didn't screw it up, so they asked me back. I've never been an experienced mixer's boom up, although I'd like to be. I've never been a PA, and I'd love to avoid that if I can. But each of the eight directors I've worked with so far have told me that they love the way I approach location sound, and they've all been really happy with the tracks I've recorded for their projects, which baffles me to this day, but I'm going to roll with it. Because what I've learned is that an awareness of even a sliver of the gaps in your knowledge, combined with the willingness to ask questions before you cause problems, it'll get you pretty far. Even if not so deep down, you're super, super scared that you have no idea what you're doing. So the trick is to be honest about your limitations, but never stop being confident about what you do know. So how do you do that? A couple ways. One, you could lie and say, every take sounds great, but I don't recommend it. Two, and what I do recommend is just give the director or the first AD your honest evaluation of the previous take every time and ask for another if you think you need one it's what the dp does it's what the actors do and it's what you should do which brings me to number three the quality of a film sound falls to you and you're gonna have to fight for intention okay one of the hardest things i've had to learn in the past couple of years is that sometimes you really have to fight to be heard and it's not because nobody cares about you it's not because people think you're stupid it's because you don't see sound 
So think of it this way. Chances are, as a sound recordist, especially on a low-budget feature, you're only one out of maybe a couple of people on set who has any idea what the audio sounds like coming through the microphones. And there's a ton of other stuff to worry about that everyone can see, like wardrobe, makeup, set dressing, camera movement, actors' performances, and on and on and on and on and on. So sometimes you will have to interrupt a celebratory moving on to deliver the bad news that I uh, kind of like to get one more, one more just for safety. And people will be upset. They might be surprised. They might be confused. But you know what? If part of a take is bad, the take is bad. And a great performance is useless in the final product if you didn't capture it properly. So it sucks to be the one to ask for just one more take. But even if the actors nailed the performance, the lighting was perfect, and the wonderfully choreographed three-minute one-shot went off without a hitch, the take is no good if the sound sucks. Maybe a plane flew overhead. Maybe a toilet flushed down the hall and the pipes run right over your location. Maybe, just maybe, you knocked your boom against the ceiling because your arm got tired at the wrong moment. You know, whatever it is, your responsibility is to the sound you're recording, not to your ego. If something's messed up, say something. The director might get frustrated, they might even snap at you a little, but that's almost always going to be because they're also managing a ton of other stuff. At the end of the day, they're going to be happy you called for that fifth take if it means their movie sounds better. And, speaking of angry directors, we're at number two. The further into the day you get, the further into the shoot you get, the more irritable and angry people become. You know, discipline wanes, actors get tired and lose focus, art department disappears for a smoke again, the first AC is sick of the DP, and they're both sick of you complaining that there's literally nowhere to put your mic that doesn't ruin the shot. Tough. That's what happens when you put a bunch of craftsmen who take pride in their work in a small space and ask them to work alongside each other for 14 hours. Things get touchy. Your job is to know that, Expect it of yourself and of others and work around it. So don't yell, try real hard not to snap at anyone and keep your eye rolls to yourself. And fun fact, I just listed three things I've caught myself doing in the last three months. And this can be especially hard when you're the sound guy because couched in every request for five minutes to treat for reflections, heads up about the potential necessity for ADR, and a hold time for a nearby car to leave the driveway is the assumption that everyone will take you at your word because, and you'll never stop reminding yourself of this, most of the people around you are visual artists. And again, you can't see sound. But if you stay calm and communicative and respectful, you can make yourself understood even when everybody's a little frayed around the edges, and your colleagues will come to trust your judgment as a result. It might not prevent, you know, a little outburst here and there, but again, everyone gets tired and cranky. Just stay focused and don't take anyone else's irritation too personally. Speaking of irritation, number one. This is the thing that I, I, I learn new levels of each and every time I'm on set, and it's this. You are gonna make mistakes, but... The mark of a good craftsman is not infallibility, it's the ability to solve problems. So just this past weekend, I made a gigantic mistake. It was easily the biggest mistake I've ever made. So we had a bunch of really complicated shots that uh, a complement of wireless lav mics, you know, was just the perfect solution for. And I found out the producer could get them for me. Because again, indie production, I'm new at this. I don't have a big kit. I don't have $20,000 to spend on it. So the producer rents these mics per my recommendations and I get to set and I start organizing my gear and I realize the wireless receivers I ordered were designed to run off of a DC power supply that I totally did not order. And since it was a weekend shoot, there was no going back to the rental place to find another solution. There was no fixing this mistake. And so my first thought was, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. But my second thought was, oh my god, I have no idea what I'm doing. And then my third thought was, oh, I'm going to have to tell someone. So I had a choice. You know, try to work the next 29 shooting hours without letting on that we weren't using labs and just pretend it was all going according to plan anyway. Or I could own up to my mistake and see how people felt. So I did that. But here's the thing. You should never go to someone with a problem, especially one you caused, without also offering a solution. Even if that solution is, I screwed up, and I don't know how to fix it, so I'm asking you, how do I unscrew up? 
And in my case, I told the producer, the AD, and the director what was going on and said, but here's how we can still get amazing sound. So we'll have to work together on a couple of things, but I guarantee you this is still going to sound amazing. We just might need an extra couple of minutes or an extra couple of takes on these shots. And then I spent the rest of the shoot making really damn sure that I was actually getting amazing sound, because that is not a promise you want to renege on. And the best part of that whole experience, as embarrassing as it was, and I'm still like feeling that embarrassment, is that the people I was working for seemed to actually gain confidence in my abilities. You know, I told them flat out that I had reached a previously unknown limit to my existing knowledge base, which resulted in a mistake that A, couldn't be fixed, and B, created additional hardship for an already like super tight, super low budget shoot. And at the end of the weekend, everyone was still you know, reasonably happy with me because even though there was a problem, even though I caused it, I fixed it. And I think that's really key. So that's it. Well, okay, it's not like it, but it's certainly a, a snapshot of some of the most important lessons I've learned so far in my nascent career as a guy who does movie stuff and usually it's location sound. And it's really, really a great business to be in if you're inclined toward this sort of thing. But, and here's a bonus point for you, it's not easy. It doesn't mean it's not fun or exciting or rewarding, but starting out in this business is to start at the ground floor of a very large building with invisible moving doors. It's essentially a highly competitive industry made up entirely of freelancers. As a result of that, when you get started, even if you get a two-week gig, those checks take a while to come in and rent's due tomorrow. And unless you're fortunate enough to come to town with say, a bit of family wealth at your back, you're going to be quite hilariously poor for a while. So be good at what you do. Because that means something. Even if what you do is learn to be a sound guy. That means something. Make friends and make movies with them because that means something. Because even if you have to deliver pizzas to keep a roof over your head, you'll never spend your life making movies if you don't, you know, actually spend your life making movies. And that's the point. That's why you go through all this. So thanks so much to our friendly neighborhood anonymous production assistant for letting me drop my 2 to 15 cents in the bucket this week. I really appreciate it. If you guys have any questions about my experiences, especially as someone who hasn't gone to film school, but nevertheless seems to find at least a little bit of work doing it, uh, you can hit me up on Twitter at Mr. Stonebender, uh, a link which you'll find in the show notes, I'm sure. Thank you so much, and thanks for listening. And that's it for Crew Call. If you'd like to support the podcast, remember to click the Amazon link on the Tapa website before you go shopping. It doesn't cost you anything, and Amazon gives us a little kickback. Everyone wins. And if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. Good or bad, we really appreciate the feedback. And hey, it's me again, and I'm not going to thank myself, but I am going to tell you that next week, Tapa will return, bringing you a fantastic guest in the form of second assistant director, Anthony Robinson. 